If you've been programming in JavaScript long enough, then you'll remember a time when all asynchronous code was written with callbacks. While an extremely useful primitive, callbacks tend to lead to unwieldy, hard to debug, and hard to communicate code. It was, and if you're unlucky enough, still is, an easy way to end up in a situation like this, the so-called callback hell. But then promises came along and saved us, providing an abstraction that allows for flatter, cleaner, and more readable asynchronous code. Promises proved such a success that they are now built right into the core of the language in almost every single JavaScript engine, making them highly performant as well as expressive. But what if, in some post-apocalyptic scenario, all of that progress were to just disappear and we were left back where we started, in callback hell? Could we rebuild and restore the utopia of the promised land? That's what we're going to find out today on low-level JavaScript. What is a promise, really? The standard definition, or rather the specification of a promise, can be found on the Promises slash A plus website. This document describes exactly how a promise should behave, but not exactly how to implement one. Let's read through the terminology section, so we're all speaking the same language. A promise is an object or a function with a then method whose behavior conforms to this specification. A thenable is an object or a function that defines a then method. A value is any legal JavaScript value, and that includes undefined, a thenable, or a promise, or anything else. Exception is a value that is thrown using the throw statement. And a reason is a value that indicates why a promise was rejected. Now, we are going to refer back to this document from time to time when the trickier edge cases come up. But for the most part, I'd like to develop this implementation from the intuition perspective, building them based on what we know about how promises work. So let's dive into the editor. We're going to write a class called LLJS promise. And just like any other promise, it takes a computation function in the constructor. So we're crystal clear about what this computation function actually is. Let's write out a small example. As you can see, the computation function is one that receives as arguments a resolve function and a reject function. The user of the promise can call either one of these functions when they're done with the async stuff they need to do. In this example, Resolve is called with the value 42 after one second. So as the implementer of the promise class, it's going to be our responsibility to write and inject those functions into the user's computation function. But we'll get into that in a moment. First, let's return to the constructor and add some private properties to the promise class that will keep track of and control the mechanics. The first of these is state. A promise can only be in one of three states. It can be either pending, fulfilled, or rejected. If the promise is in either a fulfilled or a rejected state, then we can say that that promise is settled. Let's put these into an object so we don't have to use strings everywhere. And a promise always starts out in the pending state because the computation has not yet begun running. A promise, when it settles, will have either a final value or a reason that it rejected. So let's add those as well. We'll start them out as undefined since we're in the pending state. Now, the main way that we interact with a promise is by calling its dot then and dot catch methods. Both of these end up creating new promises, which are dependent on the result of this promise. So mechanically speaking, we'll need a way to communicate with these promises which are created based on this promise. The first step in doing that is tracking those promises in a queue, and we're going to model that as an array. Our implementation is also going to include a finally method on the promise. Dot finally also creates new promises, so we will need to keep track of those in another queue. The final thing we need to do in the constructor is actually to begin running the computation function. First, we'll actually check that we got a function, and then if we did, we're going to run it, injecting two private methods one called onFulfilled and one called onRejected. Both of these methods will be bound with the current promise so that when they're actually called, 
internally they will have the this value that we would expect. Now this computation function, it could also throw an error. We can safely catch that with a try catch block. And we'll come back a little bit later and fill in the catch handler. And we're pretty much done with the constructor now, except that this is actually the first tricky edge case. The specification in section 2.2.4 states that onfulfilled or onrejected must not be called until the execution context stack contains only platform code. This fairly cryptic sentence is elaborated on in section 3.1, where it states, here, platform code means engine, environment, or promise implementation code. In practice, this requirement ensures that onfulfilled and onrejected execute asynchronously after the event loop turn in which the dot then is called and with a fresh stack. This can be implemented with either a macro task mechanism such as set timeout or set immediate, or a micro task mechanism such as mutation observer or process dot next tick. So in essence, we need to delay the running of the user's computation function until the next cycle of the event loop. We're going to use set timeout for this, wrapping up the whole try catch block into a set timeout callback with no time delay. Now with the setup part done, we can move on to some of the methods. We actually know of five methods that we have to implement already. Dot then, dot catch, dot finally, and the onfulfilled and onrejected private methods that we've defined here. Let's start out with the onfulfilled method. Now, before writing the logic, let's revisit the promise example from earlier. This promise will resolve after one second with the value 42. When it calls the resolve function, it's of course actually calling our internal onfulfilled method. We can see this easily by adding a console log inside the onfulfilled method and running this code. So what do we actually want to do when this method is called? Well, we should change the state to fulfilled and record the last value that we got. And after that, any promises that were created by calling dot then, dot catch, or dot finally, the ones in the then queue and the finally queue, those should be informed of this new value so that they can begin using that value to compute their own new state. The logic that deals with communicating with the queues is going to be placed into a method called propagate fulfilled, which we will write shortly. But we need to wrap all of this code in a check because one of the rules of promises is that once they have settled with a value or a reason, they have that value or reason forever. In other words, we should only do these actions if we're in a pending state. Now, all of this code is more or less mirrored in onRejected. The only difference here is that we're going to a rejected state and we're setting a reason instead of a value. And obviously when we propagate this, we need to call a different method. So we'll call that propagate rejected. I'll add those two method skeletons to the code so that it doesn't complain when these are called and don't exist. Before we go and flesh out those propagation methods, let's write dot then, since that's the core of the promise and it's what we'll interact with the most. So then actually takes two arguments, though it's more often called with one. The first is a function that transforms the value if the promise is fulfilled. And the second is another function that transforms the reason if the promise happens to reject. So this method, along with catch and finally, they will always return a new promise. And this feels quite intuitive. If you have a piece of code like this, then you would expect promise plus one to have no effect on promise minus one. So nothing we do to the original promise can modify its value once it's settled. So we'll create a new promise, but not pass in a computation function. That's going to give us a promise that is always in the pending state. I've called this promise controlled promise, because we are in control of how it changes state rather than the user's computation function. So we can push an array into the then queue and that will contain the controlled promise and its fulfilled transforming function and its rejected transforming function. In order to actually update the controlled promises state, this promise, 
the sort of parent promise, must be settled. So at the time that the user calls dot then, it could very well be that we're already settled. So we can actually check for that right here in this method. If the state of the parent promise is fulfilled, but the user called dot then after it happened, we want to propagate that information to any and all of the promises in the then queue, including the one being created from this very call. And we can do the same thing for rejected, only calling the propagate rejected method instead. And of course, if the parent promise is not in the fulfilled or the rejected state, then it must still be pending, meaning that the controlled promise has to wait. Now that our promises are able to resolve properly, we can chain the promises together with dot then, and we can finally implement the propagate fulfilled method. The goal of this method is to communicate with the promises that we have in the queues, the ones which are dependent on the value of this promise. So we can loop through the then queue, destructuring the controlled promise and its fulfilled function. This fulfilled function might not be defined, so we need to check that it actually is indeed a function before we do anything else. This function is used to calculate the value or the rejection reason of the controlled promise, and it takes as an argument the value of its parent promise. What this function returns might be a regular JavaScript value, but it also might be another promise. When it returns a promise, it assimilates it, which is a sort of fancy way of saying that it waits for that promise to settle and then uses its value. In order to check that it's a promise, we could do something like instance of LLJS promise, but the specification states that we should do this check in a much more relaxed way. Essentially, we should only be checking if the value or promise has a dot then method. If it does, we should treat it like a promise. So let's write a quick utility function for this called is thenable. Now we can check if we're dealing with a promise or we're dealing with a normal value. If it is a promise, then we need to wait for it to settle, taking on a value or a rejection reason and pass that result to the controlled promise. Luckily for us, that's as simple as adding dot then to value or promise and handling the resolution or rejection. If it's fulfilled, then we just call on fulfilled of the controlled promise. If it's rejected, we call on rejected of the controlled promise. And if it turns out that the value we got is not a promise, but just a regular JavaScript value, then we can just immediately call on fulfilled on the controlled promise. The only case left for us to handle is when the fulfilled function is actually not defined. The specification says that if the function is not defined, then we should just give the controlled promise the value of this promise, which is easy enough. We just call onFulfilled with this dot value and we don't modify it in any way. Now that we've processed the entire then queue, we can go and reset it to an empty array. That way, if the user would call dot then on this promise later, we wouldn't update any of the promises that we've already dealt with. Let's give this a spin. We can use our example promise from the beginning to test this out. We're going to create a new variable called first then that, as you might expect, calls dot then on the promise. Its transforming function is going to log out the value that we got, and then it's going to return that value plus one. And to see if this whole cycle works, let's add another one called second then that logs the new value from the first then and again returns a modified value. And when we run that, we see that the first then correctly receives the value 42 and the second one gets 43, since that was the new value calculated on the first. If we go back to the code and we change the second then to be based on the original promise instead, we will see that both logs show the value 42, which proves that these promises are not interfering with each other. So far, so good. Let's handle the rejections now. We've already implemented taking a rejected transforming function in dot then, but most people want to use the dot catch method for this. Fortunately for us, dot catch is actually just a sort of special case of dot then. It takes a catch function, but not a fulfilled function. So we only need to return this dot then with undefined as the first argument and our catch function as the second.
However, for our calls to dot catch to have any effect whatsoever, we actually need to implement the method propagate rejected. It's fairly similar to propagate fulfilled with only a couple of minor differences. When we process the then queue, we need to destructure the catch function instead of only the fulfilled function. And since we don't even care about the fulfilled function, I'm just going to name that underscore to make it clear that it's not used. To get the next value or promise, we use the catch function. If the value or promise comes back as a promise, then we do exactly the same thing we did before, with the controlled promise eventually taking on either the value or the rejection reason that comes out. If it's not a promise, but just a regular value, then we're going to do the same thing. We call the controlled promises on fulfilled method. This is because catch is used to recover from errors. In other words, catch is for turning rejections back into normal promises. And if catch function wasn't actually a function, most likely because it was undefined, then as per the specification, we will give the controlled promise the same reason for rejection as this promise by calling its onRejected method. Finally, we set the then queue to empty, and let's see if we're actually able to catch some rejections now. In our example, when we change resolve to a reject and run the code again, we don't see any output in the console. So we can add a dot catch to the first then, which logs the error and returns a recovered value. Running this, we get an error log, and we also see the log coming from the second then, with the value that came from catch. But we're only returning values from our thens and our catches. We should also test what happens when we return promises. One of the easier ways to create promises in a particular state is to use a static resolve or reject method. We can quickly implement those to use in our testing. So if I wrap up the recovered value in an LLJS promise.resolve, nothing should actually change. We should still see the got value recovered log. But if we return a rejected promise, then the log should disappear. In order to catch this, we'll need to add another catch, so I'll put one on the second then. And now we see that log appear. So when we return promises, they also appear to be propagating correctly. Calling reject is not the only way that a promise can enter the rejected state. Under certain conditions, if an error is thrown inside a promise, then that promise also will reject. This behavior is fairly easy to add now because we have all the pieces in place. In the constructor, we have that try catch block that surrounds the call to the user's computation function. If an error is thrown inside the computation function, then we will enter this catch block. When that happens, we can just call this.onRejected with the exception value. Let's try that out too. We'll go back to resolving after one second, but this time we'll throw an error after the set timeout. And we see that the error is successfully caught by our calls to dot catch. Now, one of the last things we need to do is to implement finally. Promises created with dot finally only run after the parent promise either resolves or rejects. The funny thing about how finally actually works is that the function it gets as an argument is not actually expected to return a value, nor does the finally function receive the value or a reason. Essentially, it lets you perform a side effect when the promise is settled, mostly to run cleanup code. We can only run the side effect function if the promise is settled. We can check that by seeing if we're in a state other than pending. Then we can actually run the side effect function and return a promise whose value or rejection is just the same as this promise. We don't get to return a new value from finally. If the promise was still pending, then we're gonna create a controlled promise and add it and its side effect function to the queue, just like we would with dot then or dot catch. Now, whenever either propagate fulfilled or propagate rejected are called, we also need to go through the finally queue and run the side effect. Starting with propagate fulfilled, we can iterate through the finally queue 
and destructure the controlled promise as well as its side effect function. We can then run the side effect function and trigger the onResolved method of the controlled promise. And just like the then queue, we can empty it afterwards. And of course, we can do exactly the same thing with propagate rejected, only we need to change the onResolved call to an onRejected call. And now we're ready for a big test. So let's bring back a callback based function from Node, which we can promiseify with our implementation. fs.readfile will work perfectly for this. Our function will also be called readfile uh, and takes the same file path and encoding arguments as the file system readfile. Inside the promise, we will call fs.readfile with our arguments and add a callback that gets the error and the value. If there's an error, we're going to reject with that error, and otherwise we will return the value. Let's just add one more asynchronous function, which we can call delay. Delay takes a time in milliseconds and a value, and it returns a promise that resolves with that value after the time has elapsed. And so our test program is going to be reading this very JavaScript file. Then we take the text and we log out how many characters were read and we return a delayed promise whose value is this text but we will remove all of the vowels. Then we can add another then which will just print out the first 200 characters of this new text. We should also add a dot catch so we can catch any errors. We'll just print the error here and we'll add a dot finally where we can just log a message that will say everything is complete. And when we run it, we'll see that we're able to read around 4,000 characters. And a short time later, the text is printed without any vowels. At the end, we see the done message. But what if there was an error? Let's change the file name to something that doesn't exist. And now we only see the error message, but we also see the done message because the finally will always run regardless of whether we resolved or we rejected. And that's pretty much all there is to it. In the next installment, we'll take a look at how we can create our own implementation of async await using generator functions, as well as assessing some of the drawbacks and alternatives to promises. So be sure to subscribe for that. All the code from today is available on GitHub, so you can use that as a basis to expand, or you can just follow along. Thanks to all the patrons whose support massively helps this channel. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.